to possible four proceedings and also the possibility that uh, any one of our colleagues may object to uh, proceeding past 12 o'clock noon. Uh, so this will require us ending the open session at by 11 a.m. and then moving immediately to a closed session at SVC 217. I ask uh, that members strictly adhere to the five minute timeline and I will uh, tap on my gavel to remind people. Uh, in that spirit, I will uh, submit my opening statement for the record, uh, Senator Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would submit my uh, statement for the record as well. Thank you very much, Senator Fisher. And let me recognize Secretary Kendall. Mr. Secretary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Reed, uh, Senator Fisher, members of the committee. General Saltzman, General Alvin, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Department of the Air Force's FY25 budget submission. The Department of the Air Force uh, budget request supports the national defense strategy. We appreciate the committee's support for the recently enacted FY24 budget and your efforts to secure timely passage. As you are aware, the six month delay has had a real impact. That time cannot be recovered, but at least we can now move forward with our urgent modernization priorities. As I have testified before this committee repeatedly, time is my greatest concern. We are in a race for military technological superiority with a capable pacing challenge. Our cushion is gone. We are out of time. As we have briefed the committee at the classified level, the pacing threat moves steadily forward. I appreciate the opportunity to have a classified session today, Mr. Chairman, as well. Continued failure to provide on-time authorities and appropriations will leave the Air Force and Space Force inadequately prepared. We know the committee recognizes this, and we appreciate your strong bipartisan support. Our FY25 budget request complies with the Physical Responsibility Act. We are requesting $217.5 billion for the Department of the Air Force, which includes $188 billion for the Air Force and $29.4 billion for the Space Force. The FY25 budget reflects an increase of about 1.5% over the enacted FY24 budget and does not keep pace with inflation or with the 7% publicly acknowledged growth of China's military budget. To stay within the levels of the FRA, the Department of the Air Force had to adjust our previous plans. The 25 budget request seeks to preserve the momentum behind our modernization efforts, particularly the work on operational imperatives that we initiated and that this committee supported in FY24. In order to preserve modernization, we have marginally reduced procurement and we have sustained our foundational accounts at levels we deemed acceptable, but no more. Because the Space Force budget is dominated by research and development uh, accounts, we have had to marginally reduce the pace and scope of our Space Force modernization programs. Our first priority in the National Defense Strategy remains Defense of the Homeland, which the Department of the Air Force primarily supports through investments in domain awareness, air and space defense, early warning, and cyberspace defense programs. Our second National Defense Strategy priority is to deter strategic attack against the United States, our allies, and our partners. The Department of the Air Force 25 budget request prioritizes nuclear modernization to maintain a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent. Notably, the Sentinel ICBM program has experienced unacceptable cost and schedule increases and is currently undergoing a non McCurdy review. The Department of the Air Force will work closely with the committee as that review reaches its conclusions. The third national defense strategy priority is to deter aggression and be prepared to prevail in conflict when necessary. The Department of the Air Force needs immediate and significant capability modernization to keep pace with our growing military capabilities of the PRC. The Department of the Air Force operational imperatives and the closely related cross-cutting operational enablers continue to guide our modernization program. The FY25 DAP budget request includes $6.1 billion for these efforts. Finally, the fourth national defense strategy priority is to build a resilient joint force and enduring advantages. This budget request invests to ensure that we can recruit and retain the force we need so that our airmen and guardians and their families have the quality of life they deserve and can serve to their full potential. As we have briefed the committee, the Department of the Air Force is also currently undertaking a department-wide effort to re-optimize to meet the needs of great power competition. The intent is to minimize both cost impacts and personnel or unit movement. We will work closely with the committee as we develop detailed plans. We do not anticipate any significant impact on the FY25 budget, and we have not requested funds for this purpose. 
The DAF also appreciates the uh, committee's support for the DOD Quick Start Initiative that was enacted last year. The Department of the Air Force has obtained approval from the Secretary of Defense for two programs that will be initiated under this new authority. They are a more resilient national GPS uh, position navigation and timing capability and C3 battle management for moving target indication. Time matters, but so do resources. The United States is facing a competitor with national purchasing power that exceeds our own, a challenge we have never faced in modern times. China is actively developing and expanding capabilities to challenge strategic stability, attack our critical space systems, and defeat our ability to project power, especially air power. Conflict is not inevitable, but it could happen at any time. General Alvin and I just returned from a trip to some of our key bases in the Indo-Pacific. We should all be very proud of our men and women serving in harm's way and doing everything they can to deter and to be ready for a conflict unlike any we've seen before. The Department of the Air Force FY25 budget request is focused on addressing these realities. We commit to working with the committee to secure timely enactment of this budget request. Thank you. We look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. General Alvin, please. Good morning, Chairman Reed, Senator Fisher, and distinguished members of this committee. Today, I'm proud to represent the 677,000 total force airmen serving our nation. I want to thank you for your unyielding support not only for those airmen, but for their families as well. I'd like to open by stating my immense pride in the exemplary performance of our airmen this past weekend. As part of a joint and coalition effort, they successfully thwarted a massive air attack by Iran on Israel's home soil. Their professionalism and skill turned a potentially catastrophic event for Israel into a strategic defeat for Iran and its proxies. As we look across the strategic landscape, we find ourselves in a time of significant consequence. The simultaneous demands of strategic competition with an aggressive and increasingly capable PRC and persistent acute threats from around the globe require the Air Force to maximize the readiness of today's forces while adapting our structures and processes to offer the best opportunity to prevail in an environment of enduring competition. Time is not on our side. The FY25 Air Force budget request reflects difficult choices. We've made trade-offs to keep the Air Force's operational readiness today at the minimum acceptable to meet the nation's demands while seeking to preserve the previous year's advances in modernization. The Air Force budget request also invests in the Air Force's most precious asset, its airmen, to ensure they remain the decisive advantage upon which the nation depends. Strategic deterrence is a key priority in our national defense strategy and the United States Air Force remains committed to the recapitalization of our nuclear force. We're actively supporting the process triggered by the nunn mccurdy breach of the Sentinel program and will continue to pursue the path of a safe, secure, reliable, and effective ground leg of the nuclear triad well into the future. Our ability to support the national defense strategy priority of deterring aggression and prevailing in conflict demands a modern Air Force that is connected to the Joint Force and can close multiple kill chains in minimal time to control the tempo of a complex fight with a peer competitor. To that end, the FY25 budget proposes continued investments in the F-35 and F-15EX, albeit with fewer than preferred quantities dictated by the constraints of the Fiscal Responsibility Act. We remain committed to the Advanced Battle Management System, C3 Battle Management, and to the NGAD family of systems, particularly collaborative combat aircraft, which will allow the Air Force to deliver the affordable mass required to be effective against a very capable PRC. We're also committed to building forward-based resiliency, enough to enable continued sword degeneration, even while under attack. To arrest the decline in our readiness, we have proposed modest increased investment in flying hours and the weapon system sustainment funding to support them, while prioritizing investments in critical physical and cyber infrastructure. Our airmen are and will always be the deciding factor in any conflict our Air Force faces, and we are committed to their health, development, and quality of life. We have made significant progress thanks to Congress's support to increase basic pay, adjust the basic allowance for housing and subsistence, to account for macroeconomic factors. There's still work to be done. During our recent trip to the Indo-Pacific, Secretary Kendall and I saw dedicated airmen eager to accomplish the mission, despite infrastructure degradation caused by natural disaster and persistent environmental challenges, as well as limited access to the healthcare enjoyed by many Kona spaces. The job of your Air Force has not changed since its inception. Support and defend this nation through credible deterrence and unmatched combat prowess. To preserve that level of deterrence, we must maintain our readiness today, modernize our forces for tomorrow, 
and provide the absolute best support for our airmen. Success on any battlefield is a team effort. I want to thank the members of Congress and this committee for your past and continued support. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General, uh, General Saltzman, please. Chairman Reed, Senator Fisher, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for your continued support and for the opportunity to testify on the Space Force's posture for fiscal year 25. As the Space Force prepares to celebrate its fifth birthday, we are wholly dedicated to the work of forging a service purpose-built for great power competition. Space has never been more critical to the security of our nation, and the success or failure of the joint force depends heavily upon the capabilities we present. It is our responsibility to contest and control the domain, to defend U.S. space capabilities, and to protect the joint force from space-enabled attack. Gaining and maintaining space superiority is the purpose for which the Space Force was established. With about 3% of the Department of Defense budget, the Space Force offers a tremendous value proposition to the nation. Every dollar invested in space brings asymmetric returns, but that means every dollar cut creates asymmetric risk. Against a near-peer adversary, space superiority is the linchpin. Without it, we cannot deter conflict. Without it, we cannot provide vital effects. Without it, we cannot protect the joint force. Until we have built the infrastructure to achieve space superiority, the Space Force is a work in progress. The Space Force's theory of success includes three parts. Avoiding operational surprise, denying the benefits of attack in space, and conducting responsible counterspace activities. The Space Force budget request is designed to support the national defense strategy by building, training, and equipping the forces the nation needs to perform each activity, preserving freedom of action in space, while deterring and denying adversarial objectives. Avoiding operational surprise requires us to maintain an accurate understanding of the space domain at all times. 8.3% of our budget is dedicated to this aim. Operating across disaggregated sensor frameworks, the Space Force provides the maximum information possible to decision makers from the tactical to the strategic level. Denying the benefits of attack in space demands that we make any attack against U.S. space capabilities impractical and self-defeating. 43.4% of our budget is devoted to this objective. Investing in resiliency for missile warning and tracking, satellite communications, and precision navigation and timing. Hybrid architectures and proliferated constellations impose a heavy cost on aggression. Finally, responsible counterspace activities describes the mechanism by which the Space Force contests and controls the space domain. The FY25 budget dedicates 24.7% of the Space Force budget to space superiority. Within the constraints of the FRA, fiscal year 25 Space Force budget reflects hard choices to maintain legacy space services and preserve current readiness, but it also slows the fielding of a modernized force. Addressing these challenges depends on guardians that are trained and ready to meet the high-tech demands of space operations. For that reason, I would like to personally thank the committee for its support for the Space Force Personnel Management Act. This will be a major force multiplier in the Space Force's efforts to modernize the way we recruit, build, and retain talent. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Space Force's FY25 budget and posture. Even in the face of accelerating threats, the Space Force remains the preeminent military space organization in the world. With the support of this committee, our guardians will preserve and expand our strategic advantage, and we will step up to meet the challenge of our pacing threat. And so as long as you continue to trust and invest in your space service, the Space Force will respond with unparalleled value for the nation. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, General Saltzman. Mr. Secretary, uh, we have been endeavoring for the last several years to replace the E-3 AWACS uh, aircraft, which uh, has certainly served well, but uh, it is reaching its limits. Uh, could you fill us in on the progress towards getting the E-7 uh, in the air to replace the E-3? Uh, we're still moving ahead with the E-7. It's funded in the 25 budget. Uh, we had to slip... Uh, production of one one aircraft uh, a, a year to the right. Uh, the price that we got from the prime came in much higher than we had anticipated. And we've been involved in negotiations to try to get it down. We have come much closer, but we're not really at closure yet, so we have some additional work to do there. Uh, so I, I'm anticipating, uh, maybe being optimistic here, but hopefully that we'll get to uh, an agreement very shortly and then be able to move on with the program. 
we're still committed to the program, but we've got to have an affordable aircraft. Uh, uh, the Australians, uh, among others, have the E-7. Uh, our version would be more sophisticated or quite different. It, it would be, uh, it would have to include all of our communication systems and so on. So there are a number of modifications from the original E-7, which is several years old, that have to be made to meet our requirements. That's part of the problem with the cost. Thank you, Mr. Uh, General Alvin, uh, a significant part of the life cycle course of an aircraft is sustainment cost. And I think around here, we, uh, our first reaction is the sticker shock. You mean it costs X? but we don't realize how much it really costs to keep flying. For example, the F-35 is, uh, I think, about $39,000 per hour of flying. Uh, can you tell us what progress the Air Force has made in reducing the life cycle cost of the F-35 system in particular? Uh, thank you, Chairman. And, of course, the F-35 will be the backbone of our force into the future, so having it sustainable is, is certainly uh, required for us to be able to afford it and all the other things. The Joint Program Office has been undertaking this, uh, what they're referring to as a war on readiness, trying to understand each of the individual elements and segments that are driving the cost out. Uh, and I think uh, that, that program is, is underway. We expect to see some results from that in the very near future. The other thing uh, is that when you, when you purchase the new weapon systems, you also have to pur purchase the uh, contract, uh, contract logistics supply system as well, which adds a, a bit of addi additional cost to it. So digging into that, and understanding how we might be able to transition to this performance-based logistics is another way into the future. As you know, we've been working back and forth uh, with the Prime on how to do that. We couldn't come to a conclusion uh, that was satisfactory for both sides to be able to have all of the things that we needed. So we are going to re-enter that as well to ensure that in the future we can have a performance-based logistics system that will drive down the cost of sustainment as well. And there's been a determination, I, I presume, over time that uh, contractor-based uh, sustainment is more efficient than uniformed sustainment by military personnel? That was certainly the, uh, the premise when they put into the CLS. And so now we're looking at adjusting that uh, to the current environment, how we may be able to adapt to ensure that we can get some of the efficiency and affordability, but also the operational responsiveness that we need. Thank you. Uh, General Saltzman, your chief task is to provide the uh, trained and equipped Space Force Guardians. And can you sort of give us a sense of what are the obstacles you're facing in that? Yeah, thank you, Senator. The, um, the conditions have changed radically in space over the last 10 years or so. One of the analogies Secretary Kendall and I use is it's akin to going from a merchant marine and transforming into a U.S. Navy. Mm -hmm. That requires different equipment, that requires different training. And so what we're working on currently is advancing the training of our guardians. Uh, we've invested in fiscal year 25 about $438 million to enhance the training infrastructure. This includes new simulators, new ranges, uh, aggressor forces to simulate the threat, all to give them realistic training for the competitive environment they're gonna face. But maybe more importantly, and certainly more in terms of investments, is giving them the equipment they need, resilient architectures that are gonna be more uh, capable, more effective in the contested environment, and looking for the counter space capabilities to deny an adversary the ability to use space-enabled targeting against our joint force. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, and gentlemen, thank you for your testimony. Senator Fisher, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, gentlemen. I share with many of my colleagues a deep concern regarding the future of the United States Air Force. Its fighters, bombers, tankers, and cargo aircraft are in constant rotation around the world, ready to combat any threat. I understand that we must modernize our forces and divest when it makes sense to do so. However, many of the aircraft that the Air Force has requested to divest in this year's budget such as the F-15Es, are among the most combat capable with expensive upgrades and thousands of flight hours remaining on the aircraft. In the event of conflict, we need not only capability, but also capacity. Not every place in which the Air Force is expected to operate is a high-end threat environment. I'm especially concerned about the impact of these budget caps on the Space Force whose programs form the backbone of every other service's combat capability. 
communications, command and control, and guidance for weapon systems all rely on space. And more vital mission sets are expected to move to space in the near term, though not fast enough to justify such rapid divestment of airborne programs. Yet this budget request does not include the resources necessary for the Space Force to grow its capability at scale and at the speed of relevance. Indeed, your request for Space Force is $600 million less than what the department requested last year. General Salzman, in your opening statement, you stated, quote, the Space Force lacks similar trade-off options forcing delays in needed systems, especially counterspace systems, end quote. I'm concerned about the level of risk we're accepting by delaying development of these systems. If Congress were to provide additional funding for development of these counterspace systems, would you be able to execute that funding? Yes, ma'am. We have a series of programs that are still in R&D uh, but there is a good solid program that with additional resources we would be able to accelerate and deliver capability uh, in this fight up. We've also heard a lot about what the Air Force is doing related to re-optimizing the great power competition, General Salzman. What does that look, for, look like uh, for the Space Force, please? Thank you for that. We're very excited about the re-optimization. Uh, and, and like I started in, in the previous question to Senator Reid, uh, it's about recognizing that the environment has shifted and that we have to train differently. So we have reestablished new advanced training standards for our guardians to be able to respond in this contested environment. We've also created a new force presentation model, which creates both the time and the tools uh, for our guardians to be able to train against this adversary. Um, most importantly, probably most recognizable, you'll see the establishment of a Space Futures Command. This is in recognition that there is a great many efforts that were going on in science and technology, uh, in operational concepts, new missions, and we wanted to make sure we could get our arms around that as quickly as possible and really focus delivery of the right kind of systems with the right prioritization in time so that we can continue to have an enduring advantage over our threats as we go into the future. Thank you, sir. Uh, General Alvin or Secretary Kendall, um, what, are, what are additional updates that you can share in this setting on uh, new developments in the B-21 program? Uh, the B-21 is moving forward. Uh, I'm always very careful about saying positive things about programs and development. They all have risk. But at this stage, uh, the B-21 has been performing uh, close to original scheduling and, and, and costs and delivering capability. It's in testing. We just had the milestone C approval to enter low rate production. So the program is moving forward. At this Thank point in time, at least, we're pretty happy with the progress. Great. Thank you. General Alvin, it's my understanding that one of the changes at the Air Force Nuclear Weapons Center is establishing that two-star uh, generalist PEO for international ballistic missiles. What benefits will this bring to the Air Force's capability in, to help them execute that Sentinel program? Well, uh, thank you, Senator, and this is really part and parcel to what uh, things we were looking at with the reoptimization. Understanding, keeping the main thing the main thing. Nuclear deterrence is a cornerstone of our national defense, and so the ability to oversee at the right level with the right authorities to do integration uh, of the ICBM leg of the triad is, is very important. So elevating that to the two-star level gives uh, more seniority and more authority to be able to integrate the nuclear material management and all of the systems that will be uh, able to support the ICBM leg. We think that's going to be pivotal, regardless of what comes out of the of the Nun McCurdy uh, review. Uh, going forward, that uh, ground leg of the triad, that recapitalization is going to take uh, years upon years, and so we want to ensure we have the right level of leadership and oversight to see this massive program. Correct. We need to make sure we have what we need and continue to move forward on that program. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Fisher. Senator Hirono, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for testifying today. Uh, this is for General Alvin. The Agile Combat Employment Strategy requires the appropriate posture and supporting infrastructure at locations throughout the Pacific. For example, just last week, the Air Force awarded a $409 million contract to rebuild an airfield used during World War II on the island of Tinian. General Alvin, does the Air Force have the appropriate forward air basing it needs to execute agile combat employment? And are there plans for more reclamation efforts? 
at Pacific Airfield similar to Tinian and the runway upgrade at Base Air, uh, Air Base, Baza Air Base in the island of Luzon. Well, Senator, thank you for that question. And uh, Secretary Kendall and I were there probably about two weeks ago. We're on the island of Tinian, and we certainly, it holds a, not only a, a historic place, but it also is going to be part of the future as far as our agile combat employment scheme of maneuver. So direct answer to your question, Senator, is we're on the path. We have uh, the wing commanders and the commander of Pacific Air Force with a, a very strong understanding of what it takes to do agile combat employment. And they continue through their wing level exercises to, to, to sort of to build that out, at least uh, intellectually and conceptually. And as we continue to, to fight for the resources to do that, we do have designs on several of these clusters, uh, these spoke bases to include uh, Tinian that the Secretary and I were on. You mentioned uh, a couple of the other ones, but building out not only the runway, but the, the necessary, not overly necessary, just what we need to operate those hub and spoke locations. Uh, we have a, a ways to go in the funding, but we are we are designing in the requirements, prioritizing them, and we do intend to exercise to ensure we have everything we need to execute that, that scheme of maneuver. That's going to be required. It's part of the, or maybe the major part of the reason that we need to have the, these um, um, facilities in the in the Indo-Pacific is because of recognizing that China is definitely uh, having they're reaching out to a, a number of these island nations to influence them. Is that one of the reasons that Senator, we that's correct. We want to ensure that we have the agility and be able to, to complicate their targeting calculus yes. to ensure survivability and success in that theater. Thank you. I support your effort. Secretary Kendall, last year's NDAA included a provision directing the Secretary of Defense to conduct a feasibility study regarding the advisability of transfer uh, transferring all covered space functions of the National Guard to the Space Force. The results of the study have uh, not been released, but I am concerned that uh, you are already pursuing, apparently, or DOD is, um, a provision in this year's NDAA that would move all space missions out of the National Guard. So uh, how does this, how does this change? By the way, I think it's important for us to actually have the results of this analysis, and I would hope that the analysis is always also including outreach and the in input of these National Guard units that are performing some of the space functions. I, I'm sure you know, Mr. Secretary, there are about a thousand National Guardsmen in states, not just Hawaii, there are about a hundred, but in California, Colorado, Florida, New York, Ohio, Alaska. Uh, so while that study has not even been completed, I hope that you have, out, uh, have gotten um, reached out to these National Guard units, have you, in conducting this study that we do not have the results of yet? Uh, the, the study is in final draft. First of all, let me just say that we deeply value uh, the units that are, that are part of essentially our space act capabilities. Um, we're looking at which ones will be covered under the act. Consulted with General Saltzman, and we've looked at the functions of those units to see if they fit into the Air Force or Space Force architecture more, more, more appropriately. Most of them do fit within the Space Force. There are a couple that I think uh, may be more appropriate in the Air Force, but they're all valued and they're all important. We want to have them continue to serve. We are looking at how to best make that happen. Uh, General Saltzman and I are both very strongly of the opinion that the right way to do that uh, from the point of view of national capability and for the ability to manage the Space Force is to bring those units into the Space Force, uh, ultimately under the Space Force Personnel Management Act that was just passed by the Congress last year. The, the Space Force is incredibly small and it was designed to be lean and mean, I guess is a way to put it, it's to be very efficient in how it operated and to have as minimal amount of bureaucracy associated with it. And we're very grateful that this committee and, uh, and your colleagues on the other side of the Hill supported the Space Force um, Personnel Management Act. It allows the Space Force to have full-time and part-time people in it and to be very flexible in how it manages people. So we want to bring these guard units into that same structure. And that's, that's clearly, from the point of view of the Space Force, the best solution. Mr. Secretary, I'm glad to hear that, although transferring these units into the Space Force might mean transfer the, transferring these part-time people who are located in all the states that I mentioned away from their, their states and other functions. So I have a concern about that. And, um, you know, the, the, 
General Salzman just testified today that it is very important in terms of the recruiting and retention of the people who are going to be uh, doing these functions. So um, I, I have concerns that uh, of the movement. I do have other questions, Mr. Chairman, that I will submit for the record. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Ronald. Mr. Senator Mr. Ronald, please. Mr. Chairman, if I could have one minute to, to respond to Senator Ronald. Uh, yes, the only one minute you'll get. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, there's no intention to move anyone. The, uh, so there's some concerns out there that I think are overblown. Um, people will basically have stability if they transition. Uh, we're doing this now with some of the reserves. There are about 1,000 people in the reserves, essentially, that are going to be moving under the Space Force Personnel Management Act. We're going to handle the, the, the Space Guard people the same way, basically. So they would have stability, um, uh, and they would be able to continue to serve in the way, generally, that they, they currently would serve. So there should not be a lot of concern about dramatic changes as far as any of them are concerned. So General Saltzman may want to add a quick word on that. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. That helps clarify the issue very much. Uh, Senator around, please. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Kendall, General Alvin, uh, General Salzman, thank you for your service. Um, and thank you for being with us today to share your testimony. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the actions of the pilots and air crews of the 494th and the 335th Fighter Squadrons who performed so magnificently over the weekend. We are all proud and humbled by their clear excellence and uh, to the entire joint force for the job they did uh, in responding very, very quickly. Secretary Kennel, given the events over this past uh, weekend, it seems clear to me that there is no substitute for military hardware uh, and that divesting platforms in the short term to pay for future capabilities is not necessarily uh, the most desirable option or choice. Congress must fund the department at levels commensurate to the global threat environment. Broadly speaking, in this open setting, where does your FY25 budget assume the most risk? Um, if I were to look overall at the Department of the Air Force's budget, um, I'm most concerned about the pace at which we're moving forward in space, particularly counter space. Uh, I'm not uncomfortable with where the Air Force is in terms of force structure or capabilities globally. Uh, we have a large Air Force and it's very capable. It's not as large as it once was, but we have a lot of units and the two you mentioned I think did a fantastic job, but we have a lot of other units could do very similar things if we're called upon to do that. Our average aircraft is about 30 years old uh, and we need to move forward with the next generation of capabilities as quickly as we can. On the Space Force side, though, as General Saltzman mentioned, we're going from a country that had uh, space capabilities designed to operate in space with impunity and very little in the way of counter space capabilities. So we are moving from a merchant marine-like arrangement to a military naval force arrangement, which means we've got to have resilient assets in space that will survive an attack and provide the services that are so important to the joint force. And we've got to protect the joint force uh, from the similar systems that the other side has that would threaten us and target us. So we need to do both of those things. And those are transformational capabilities compared to what we currently have in the Space Force for the most part. So my, my greatest concern, again, is time and moving forward as quickly as possible with the kind of space capabilities we need, particularly counter space. And I guess just to follow up on that, and uh, once again, I, I suspect this is one that all of you would probably participate in responding to, but... ISR is critical, and right now we've got platforms that do a great job, but they're not necessarily space-based. Space-based is critical long-term, but it would appear that right now we're still building those ISR capabilities for the combatant commander to have in order to, to finish that, that kill web. Uh, General Alvin, would it be cleared? Would, would you, at least in your professional military opinion, would you share with this committee where we are right now with regard to our, our ISR platforms that the combatant commanders are requesting at this time. Uh, absolutely, Senator. Of course, you know, uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, absolutely critical to be able to, to close those kill chains and, and have the situational awareness that the combatant commanders need. Uh, I would say that where we are is we are in a transition. I think there's a, there's a comfort with uh, the level of, of the capacity that airborne ISR has been able to provide. And during our transition to, to space 
air mix, I think, is from General Alvin, I'm going, to, I'm going to cut right to the chase on this. Fair to say we are assuming risk in this transition? Senator, I would say we assume risk in any of the transitions. We are trying to manage that risk through the platforms we have, retaining the platforms that we have through the RQ4 through 2029, and, and those that we have in the airborne layer until we get more resilience uh, through the spaceborne layer, because that is where the future is. Thank you. General Alvin, also with regard to the family, the B-21 family, uh, right now the actual platform itself, we've ordered or we're prepared to purchase 100. Would you say that that is the minimum number needed of the base platform? It, it certainly is uh, the future of our bomber force. Uh, before 100 is the program of record, I think uh, we're not going to reach that number until probably the mid-2030s and beyond. And before we commit to that as being the platform beyond that, I think there are other technological advancements uh, that we would see to be able to augment that and have a better mix because, as you know, they're, they're also, uh, there's a price to pay for them. They are going to be very capable. But the, but 100, 100, the 100, sir, is the minimum. That is a program of record. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rounds. Uh, let me recognize Senator King, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you began your testimony talking about the non McCurdy process and, and Sentinel. Um, very expensive program designed years ago. Make the case for the ground-based leg of the triad. Um, I should mention that I'm recused on Sentinel itself, but I can definitely answer your question about the ground-based leg. Um, for as long as I've been in this business, about 50 years, the, um, the, the country has relied upon the triad for nuclear strategic deterrence. It presents an adversary with a very difficult problem uh, if it's contemplating an attack against the United States. The, the ICB leg in, leg in particular, which is our largest and most responsive leg of the triad, uh, presents a dilemma because if it's attacked, it, it basically um, can be very responsive and respond immediately with a large-scale counterattack. The submarine part of the fleet provides a, a more secure reserve, if you will, uh, that is smaller in size, uh, but more survivable. And then, of course, the bomber leg provides additional flexibility and the ability to present an adversary with uh, another way in which they can be attacked. That triumvirate, that, that triad, has been enormously effective at preventing a nuclear war for more than half a century, uh, almost approaching a century now. Um, at one point, I think you could have had a debate when the only nuclear powers were Russia and the United States and our arsenals were declining, that we could have gone to some other arrangement. But the thing that's happened in the last few years that really reinforces the need for the ICBM leg is China's breakout and their, their, their expansion of their nuclear, nuclear force, and, and which is still in progress. China's, China's making huge investments in a land-based. China is making so. a large investment, and they're going to an inventory within the next few years that is comparable to that of the United States and Russia. So for the first time in our history, we're going to live in a world in which there are three large-scale nuclear powers. Uh, that's a very dangerous world, and I think reducing our capability, reducing our options in the face of that would be a, a serious mistake. And of course, the fundamental of our entire defense policy is deterrence. Exactly. In order to maintain deterrence, the, the, the ground leg is, is an important factor. Thank you. Uh, when we buy a major we weapon system, B-21, F-35, do we acquire the IP? And what I'm leading to here is the ability of our military to 3D print parts so that we're not subject to a long supply chain uh, delays and also potentially additional costs. Do we have the, uh, I believe that every, every hangar should have a 3D printer and every Navy ship should have a 3D printer so that we're not tied to that uh, long tail of, of parts. What's the, what's the status of our ac acquisition of the IP so that that can be effectuated? Our history is mixed on IP acquisition. Um, the, the F-35 is a good example of a program where we didn't do that. It was acquired initially under a philosophy of total system pro 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 procurement, which essentially left in the hands of the prime contractor a lot of control of the program. It makes it very hard to upgrade. It makes it very hard to make changes and do them in a cost-effective way and to take advantage of competition. Our more modern programs generally are, are built where we acquire the intellectual property we need to control uh, both upgrades and maintenance 
so that we have a lot more flexibility in how we manage. Uh, the B-21 is being done that way. The NGAD program is being done that way. Um, it, 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 it's one of the lessons we've learned very painfully over our history in acquisition. Uh, I'm not sure that we always get it right today, but my, my, I'm not doing acquisition anymore. I'm in a different role now, but my guidance uh, when I was doing that was that when, when we still have the benefits of competition, we need to get the intellectual property rights we're going to need for the life of the program. And we can get reasonable prices for those rights at that time uh, and then be in a position to manage the program effectively going forward. That, that's the way we should be doing this. Uh, I can't say that we do it in every case. Thank you. Uh, General Salzman, we may need to talk about this in a classified setting, but you use the term denying the benefits of attacks in space. Secretary Kendall used counter space. Clearly, we're, we're playing catch up in this uh, situation. And is there anything you can say in the open setting to provide some reassurance that we're not totally vulnerable in space right now? Uh, yes, Senator, thank you for that. The, the FY25 budget, I think, continues to advance us on a pretty uh, uh, solid time line for adding resilient architectures to the, the critical missions like missile warning, satellite communications, data transport. And so I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with where we're headed in terms of denying the benefits of an attack on our systems uh, to some degree. Uh, the problem, again, as the Secretary mentioned, was the fact that the PRC in particular has built a very robust space-enabled targeting system and continue to do so at a very rapid rate. And so scaling up to develop not just the type of counter space capabilities that we need, but the quantity of those capabilities to hold those targets at risk is where we're falling behind on the timeline. We're not just moving as, as quickly as I think we should. Thank you. General Alvin, I'm gonna submit this question for the record, but I would like some thoughts from you about the transition assistance program and how it's being implemented in the Air Force, I worry about the transition process from active duty to veteran status, very dangerous moment. And uh, so you don't need to respond now, but uh, I'll look forward to your response on that question. Thank, thank, you, you. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator King. Senator Tuberville, please. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, General Saltzman, um, uh, FY President's FY25 budget contains a new program for space ac access, mobility, and logistics. It's only $20 million. What's your plan for this? Sir, that, that type of money is used to study, to figure out if there's military utility. And so, for example, if we, we are looking at a concept called dynamic maneuvering, if we can have unlimited fuel in our spacecraft because we have the ability to service them on orbit, then we can have more dynamic orbits which are harder to target. That's the concept, that's the idea, but we really need to evaluate that to figure out if there's serious military utility there before we invest heavily in a program. And the $20 million gets us along that line. Yeah, $20 million for five years, that's not a lot of money. I mean, is that gonna get the job done? I, I believe we'll have the answers to our basic questions on military utility with that, and then we can make a determination as whether we need more funding. Yeah, how's your recruiting and retention? We're doing great. Uh, we still get thousands of applicants for hundreds of positions. Uh, and uh, we're, we're above 90% in terms of the, the people that we want to retain. So I, I'm not you know, convinced that that's gonna last forever, and so we're working hard to make sure we provide our guardians with high levels of challenges and opportunities to uh, enhance their own competencies to make sure we can retain that workforce. Thank you. Secretary Kendall, uh, recently, uh, I guess uh, you decided to cut in half the MH-139s, and we've got one or two I think we've got eight total eventually coming to Montgomery and Maxville. What's your plan on this? Yeah, I think Maxville has one already and another uh, later this year and then the full eight about a year after that. Uh, we did cut the buyback. We cut it from about 80 to about 40. And the reason for that was that the threat changed and the areas in which we expect to operate have changed. Uh, so it's a fairly expensive special purpose helicopter that uh, isn't, isn't, doesn't have that much um, utility in some of the theaters where we'd have to operate, given the threats that are there. And there are a number of other assets, and in many cases can be used for personnel recovery. So we, we basically downsized it to have what we think is a reasonable force to meet our needs, uh, given the changes in the threat. That's been the fundamental driver. Yeah. Uh, I was at uh, Tyndall Air Force Base recently. How's that coming? That was a disaster, what happened to Tyndall, but we're rebuilding it back. Is it coming along pretty good? Um, I'd have to get you a detailed answer for the record, but yes is, is basically answer your question. A lot has been put into the Tyndall to restore it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, General Alvin, uh, F-35s, we're putting a lot of eggs in the basket on this. Uh, are we getting enough flying time? 
knowing the cost uh, of F-35s of operating and maintaining. Well, Senator, we're certainly uh, trying to manage that to get as many as we can. You know, we, uh, as the, the weapon system sustainment accounts and the flying hour program accounts are very much interrelated. And so as we try and drive down the cost of what it costs to sustain that, we can put more of that into flying hours. No pilot thinks he or she ever has enough flying hours. Well, we certainly are augmented that with our synthetic training. Uh, our joint synthetic environment is also helping us understand the things that we don't necessarily want to do in open air because of security. Uh, I would say, though, that every pilot wants to fly more, but we're trying to manage that well to keep that proficiency up to keep up with the pacing threat. We want to make sure our pilots are safe, obviously. Um, in the uh, confrontations we've been having lately, has F-35 been used that you know of? The F-35 has been a part of it. Some of the, the recent ones, like over the weekend, it was not. It was not uh, required for that capability. It actually wasn't in the theater. But the assets that we had in the theater, uh, they, they come through requests from um, the combatant commander, and we provide the assets for which uh, they request. And those were satisfactory uh, in that permissive environment. In the highly contested environment, the contested environment, that is really where this fifth generation capability of the F-35 uh, provides today, but even more so into tomorrow with the tech refresh three and, and uh, block four capability, upgrade capabilities. General, how's our recruiting in the Air Force? Recruiting the Air Force is, is doing quite well. Uh, it's, it's really improving. On the active duty side, we actually just uh, recently increased our goal, and we think we're going to make that increased goal. On the reserve side, they're going to be within 1%. They think they may actually make it as well. The National Guard had a deeper deficit to recover from. I think last year they were well below. They're going to be within 5%. So we're, we're gaining on all fronts. We're certainly not resting on our laurels. In the 25 budget, we asked for another uh, $50 million to be able to distribute uh, out to, uh, to more recruiting centers, to have more uh, digitization of records and things so we can uh, also have the recruiters do more recruiting rather than just admin work. So we're not giving up that we've got it all licked right now, but we certainly are on the right path. We're increasing numbers? Absolutely. That's what you said? Yes. What percentage, do you know? Well, I would say right now we are uh, Our goal. math and public group. Well, the, the, what percent of the goal? The, Air Force, the active duty Air Force is not right now reading, reaching 100% of its goal, 101%, quite frankly, yes. which allows us to bank a few. The reserves, 99%, and the Air National Guard, about 95%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tobeville. Senator Peters, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. It's good to see all of you uh, here uh, today. Uh, Secretary Kendall and uh, General uh, Alvin, uh, as you know, this uh, past January, the uh, Air Force uh, announced that Selfridge Air National Guard Base will be receiving 12 uh, new KC-46 refueling tankers in uh, 2029. Uh, and uh, I just want to say, I don't think I can emphasize enough uh, how grateful uh, I am uh, to the Air Force uh, for making uh, this announcement, uh, certainly a, a very big deal for our area and the community is, uh, is very excited to receive uh, these uh, critical refueling tankers that will continue to play a, uh, really a tremendous strategic role for us uh, for, for decades uh, to come. Uh, at the same time, and I've talked to both of uh, General Alvin and Secretary Kendall, I also remain committed to securing a f future fighter replacement for the retiring uh, A-10s uh, that uh, are currently flying at Selfridge. The uh, Air Force uh, basing announcement uh, clearly stated at the time that the KC-46 decision does not preclude Selfridge from, quote, being considered for a future fighter aircraft mission or other potential missions in the future, uh, end of quote. And I'd just like both of you, if you would uh, kind of reaffirm and uh, commit uh, on the record that Selfridge uh, is still in consideration for a future fighter basing decision at some point. Secretary Kendall. Um, Senator Beers, thank you. Uh, Selfridge would be in consideration for future fighter uh, basing decision potentially, but at the current time we don't have uh, uh, an option to do that. And the reason we made the programmatic decision to put the KC-46 there was in part at least because of the divestiture of the A-10. So those, those, those two are linked together. Our general policy is to replace a flying mission that is divested with a like flying mission where we can. If we can't do that, we try to apply it with an, another flying mission. And then if we can't do that, we try to replace it with an enduring mission. In the case of Selfridge, the, uh, the KC-46s are basically to replace uh, the combination of the KC-135s and the A-10s. And in the future, we may be at a very different place. General Alvin mentioned in his opening statement the CCAs that we're acquiring. Uh, we don't know the final inventory number there, but we expect it to be large, so there's a possibility there. 
And we're, we're looking as we build our 26 budget at our overall fighter modernization plan overall. So there is a possibility in the future, but none that we can point to right at this time. Sure, Alvin, do you want to add any to that comment? I just to answer your specific question, it, it does not preclude, but the secretary has really laid it out with respect yeah. to the basing uh, decision and criteria. Right, but it doesn't preclude future uh, as we continue to work. And General Alvin, um, uh, and I appreciate the time that we uh, took yesterday or uh, last week rather to uh, to meet. And as part of that conversation, we discussed the uh, critical importance of the collaborative combat uh, aircraft, which Secretary Kendall uh, just referred to. Uh, we also talked about a potential pilot program to study drone operations in medium and high intensity airspace, uh, which right now is uh, problematic uh, with uh, unmanned aircraft. Uh, this pilot program would allow the Department of Defense to experiment with existing unmanned systems like the uh, MQ-9 Reaper uh, to pave the way for the employment of future platforms uh, like CCA. So my question for you, sir, is what benefits and lessons learned uh, would uh, the Air Force would the Air Force gain from this kind of pilot program, and would you support a pilot program of that nature? Uh, thank you, Senator. I, I certainly would. I think as we look forward to uh, the arc of where the uh, the contested environment in which uh, we're going to need to fight that that arc is is one that requires us to to really investigate all the options for how we maintain survivability at the right risk to be able to penetrate, to be able to survive, and to be able to close these kill chains. And it's increasingly become apparent to me that there's, there's um, ripe for study how we do it in the uncrewed area. We're, we're developing the autonomy as well. We have a, a current program uh, in parallel that we're looking at the length of the, the, the portfolio that, to which you can put autonomy in these collaborative combat aircraft, as well as how we utilize them and base them. So we're trying to go as fast as we can into the human machine teaming plan. Yeah, if I could build on that. We, we uh, discussed uh, uh, last week uh, the importance of the KC-46 refueling tanker, uh, as well as the need for some out-of-the-box thinking when it comes to collaborative combat aircraft em employment. Uh, as part of the discussion, uh, you mentioned the possibility, uh, the possibility of employing KC-46s as a command and control node uh, for future CCA uh, aircraft. Uh, you know, I understand uh, those decisions are in the very early stages, but what steps would the Air Force need to explore this KC-46 and CCA uh, command and control concept? Well, Senator, I think the first step that we need to do is to, to get better situational awareness on the KC-46s, and that's something that we're, we're uh, looking into very strongly. Uh, General Minahan has done some experiments out in the Indo-Pacific showing that if you just have a C-2 note, the ability to communicate in ways that the tanker right now can't, that starts your ability to have a more resilient command and control network. Now, whether that next step is to go from just being a uh, communications node relay to actually doing airborne battle management is, is something that can be investigated. But the first start is to ensure that you have the connectivity of your mobility platforms in the way that you didn't before. That opens up the opportunity to do more than just being a comms relay, but maybe doing more command and control. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Peters. Senator Schmidt, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Kendall, a sort of a follow-up on Senator Peters' question. Um, Missouri is home to Whiteman Air Force Base, um, and the 442nd Fighter Wing um, is there. And the A-10, um, you know, the Air Force is moving on from the A-10, uh, and that'll be really come to fruition in four years. Um, you know, it has some really experienced um, pilots and maintainers, and um, we're already starting to see the retention issues because there hasn't been a, a follow-on mission. Um, what can you tell me today about how you're approaching that? Because there are some options, but there's really just not been a lot of movement. I don't think we have an option yet for the HN replacement. Can I make I, a suggestion? Yes, the F-15 EX would be a great option. Well, we'll take that under consideration. Okay. okay. Um, Secondly, um, Rosecrans, which is in St. Joseph, Missouri, uh, is, is home to the aging fleet of, of C-130Hs. Um, interestingly, um, and you know, some have said that the last round was pretty political, as far as where they went. And I just want to make the point, um, Rosecrans trains people from all around the world. For example, the Indian Air Force comes in with their C-130Js to be trained by the folks at Rosecrans who have H's from the 1980s. There have been eight, you know, appropriated in this next round. So I guess just for, for either one of you, 
where do you see this headed? Uh, Senator, the, uh, those eight that were appropriated, certainly they go through the, the basing process and uh, the candidate bases. I understand that uh, Rosecrans is going to be considered as one of, I believe, four candidate bases uh, for those. It, obviously, it meets the criteria. That's the first part in the strategic basing process. And it does meet the criteria, obviously, because they're flying one through the other. But uh, the expectation is it will be under consideration. Uh, the Director of our Na Air National Guard Bureau works uh, closely uh, with the Secretary on, on making those decisions, but it should be in the consideration. Let me just add that I delegated the last C-130 Che basing decision to the head of the, the Air National Guard, uh, and I will probably do the same with this one. Okay. Um, Secretary Kendall, I do want to ask you, I sent a letter uh, to Secretary Austin, uh, you know, asking for some accountability with these, with these DEI positions that have found their way throughout. Um, the Pentagon in our in our armed services, um, Secretary Kendall, do you know how many DEI positions exist in the Air Force? Full time positions. Um, it, it is a relatively small number, Senator. We're we're in the process of complying with the law, and we'll comply with it. Uh, I think the due date to have this done is about the middle of June, if I remember right. So we'll get you the exact. Well, the answer is seventy. Um, seventy. Um, the Navy has 18, the Army has 19. Those are 18 and 19 too many as far as I'm concerned, but 70. What do these people do all day long? Like, I'm, I'm asking a question. What do these DEI coordinators do all day long, 70 of them, in the Air Force? Um, <laughs> I, think, I thought the number was higher than that, actually. Well, that's full-time position, so maybe I, I am actually very curious now what you're gonna what your report might show. But seventy full-time positions, what do they do? Um, they oversee programs that are in that area. They oversee our training in that area. They are responsible for some of our data collection that's related to that. We did two disparity reports in the department that were started before I came in and published shortly afterwards. They're responsible for that. Those reports show pretty significant disparities. And results of things like the criminal justice system uh, in promotions and command selection rates and then senior school selection. And those pointed us at uh, actions we could take to try to address some of those concerns. Okay. Well, I, I look... They, 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 do, they have done, I think, valuable work for the okay. department. Well, I look forward to your, your full report, and I could make a suggestion how you could be a real leader for the country. You should fire them all, every single one of them. It's so divisive, and Senator Tuberville has talked about recruiting. The elephant in the room is, the truth is, that this is dividing our folks in the military by race. It is taking us backwards. It's cultural Marxism, and somehow, you're, you know, you're here today defending this. So, you know, I've got legislation to get rid of them all. You could take a real leadership position by firing everybody tomorrow. That'd be great. I do have time for one quick question. I know that we're moving a lot of ISR capability to space, um, and I'm generally supportive of that. Um, but are you guys concerned at all that we're um, maybe moving too quickly away from some more traditional capabilities? Uh, just as a quick comment on, I think we have a fundamental difference of opinion about DEI. I, I, we do. We certainly do. Um, with regard to ISR, we are moving, we are transitioning the space because of the vulnerability of some of our airborne platforms. AWACS and JSTARs are great examples of that. The same is true with some of our UAVs, on, on unmanned aerial vehicles that operate, uh, can't operate in a contested environment. We will always have a balance between airborne capabilities and space-based capabilities. We want to confront our adversaries with a more difficult problem than just having to deal with one of those. But because of the range at which, uh, and the sophistication at which, our adversaries are reaching out to engage some of those platforms. They're pushed back so far that they can't be effective in many cases, or they have to operate in a way which limits their effectiveness in order to be survival, survivable. So we're moving a lot of that capability in the space, and we're doing it with the resilient architectures that General Saltzman talked about earlier. Thank, thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Senator Warren, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our military is the best and the strongest in the world, so it's no surprise that foreign governments have been recruiting both active duty and retired officers. The Washington Post found that hundreds of foreign governments have hired hundreds of retired officers from Saudi Arabia to Libya to the United Arab Emirates. General Alvin, is there a national security risk when our trained military personnel work for foreign governments? Uh, Senator, there certainly is. 
So retired officers working for foreign governments could endanger our military competitiveness. That's why we require retired officers who want to work for foreign governments to receive approval from their military service and from the Secretary of State. Now, we tightened up that process last year in the National Defense Authorization Act, but there are still some loopholes in this space. For example, active duty service members are allowed to start negotiating employment with foreign governments before they leave the military. General Alvin, could allowing active duty airmen to negotiate work on behalf of another government while still wearing their US uniform post risks to our national security? Well, well Senator, there's, uh, th while they're still in uniform, they are still subject to the policies the restrictions and the UCMJ I, for- I understand that, but they are also permitted to negotiate with foreign governments for their future employment. And what I'm asking is, does that potentially pose a conflict of interest that threatens our security, at least potentially? I, I'd say potentially could, yes. Sir. All right, I agree. You know, we need to strengthen our rules so that active duty personnel aren't selling their services to foreign governments while they're still in uniform. There's another loophole that we need to close. Last year, the Air Force issued a memo raising concerns about China's recruitment of both current and recently retired Air Force personnel, like pilots, maintainers, and other technical experts that have a lot of insight into US air tactics. Now, in many cases, these individuals are hired by private entities and actually may not know that they are signing up to work for a foreign government. And our laws required uh, requiring retired personnel to get approval before working for a foreign government are much less clear if the officers are hired by a private company that's doing work for that foreign government. General Alvin, from your perspective, are we in a better position to protect classified information and US national security when we know if a retired officer is working for a contractor that works for a foreign government? Uh, Senator, we are, and I think as you know, my predecessor, uh, now Chairman Brown, put out that notum, really to, to raise awareness and also to serve as a deterrent. Yes, so both of those, uh, both of those, I think, are having good effect. The uh, our AFOSI uh, is getting good reports back. But it's not only about educating um, those within the force, but also the mandatory now as you transition out. Yes, also that we're making sure we do that as well. And I appreciate that and treat this as awareness is raised on this. You know, these arrangements can pose serious conflicts of interest, and in fact, the Air Force rejected two retired generals' requests to work for an Azerbaijani cargo carrier because it would raise concerns about potential conflicts given previous contact, contracts the Air Force had awarded to the airline. So last year, I secured a position, a provision in the Senate version of the National Defense Authorization Act to require work on behalf of foreign governments, even indirectly through a private company, to be approved by the US government. I think it is foolish not to use our national security expertise to help retired service members identify if their potential employer is asking them potentially to break the law here. So I look forward to working with my colleagues and the Air Force to close any additional loopholes that allow foreign governments to target and exploit our service members. Thank you all, and thank you in particular, General Alvin, for your work in this area. Thank you, Senator Warren. Senator Ernst, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, very much for your service to our nation and to your teams as well. We appreciate you being here today. And first, Secretary Kendall, um, we know the Iowa National Guard is really important to me, and so I'm going to address to you some of the questions um, coming from our great Iowa Air Guard. Um, Secretary Kendall, when the National Guard's 185th Air Refueling Wing in Sioux City, Iowa, converted from its F-16 fighters to the KC-135 tankers way back in 2003, the United States Air Force said that they would upgrade the airfield at the Iowa National Guard facility. 
Now the 185th Air Refueling Wing might, nothing confirmed, but might lose its mission because the runway, which has not yet been upgraded, here we are 20 plus years later, is insufficient for the KC-46s, which will eventually replace the 135s. Um, so Secretary Kendall, uh, why do you feel it has taken so long to begin the airfield expansion? And do I have your commitment to work with the National Guard to assess the runway upgrade situation at the Iowa National Guard facility in Sioux City? Uh, thank you, Senator. So we have started the uh, architecture and engineering uh, activities associated with three projects at the airfield. And I think the Congress has been notified of that. So we're moving forward with, with those upgrades. There's a runway repair project at 45 million, runway extension at 47 million, and an aircraft parking apron at 45 million. They're not all the way through the process yet. This is the earlier phases, but the process has begun and we will work with you on that. Okay, can you outline maybe the time frame that we might see some of that work done? Walk me through that assessment and when we could actually see work begin. Now, on the I'll get you the details for the record, but essentially we have to get to a 35 design percent design maturity before we put a Milcon project in. So we're in the earlier stages of that process. And I'll get you the dates as to when different phases of it might be completed. Okay, thank you so much, Secretary. And um, I do understand the importance of, of transitioning to a more capable aircraft like the 46. Um, do we also have your commitment that any change uh, to the 185th Air Refueling Wing's mission set will be on pause until a full and proper MILCON assessment is completed? I'm not aware of any changes that would be would, would occur in the interim. I'll double check that and get back to you on that, but I'm not aware of it. Thank you, Secretary. It's just important that I get that on the record. <laughs> so um, again, uh, we've got such a great unit. The 185th has been uh, so engaged around the globe. Um, we wanna make sure that they are taken care of. Um, so Secretary Kendall, as we're now in an era of great power competition, the urgency of modernizing and recapitalizing our air refueling and strategic airlift capabilities is absolutely paramount. And if you could walk us through how you are ensuring our transition from the older KC-135s to the newer 46s is conducted without compromising mission readiness. Um, essentially, as we retire 135s, we're replacing them with, with, with 46s on a one-for-one -one basis, generally speaking. It's not always exactly the case. But we're trying to make sure we have a smooth transition so that we don't have a gap in, in capability uh, for the tanker fleet. Mm -hmm. And we're required to maintain the tanker fleet at a certain level, so we have to stay within those statutory constraints. Okay, thank you. And General Alvin, um, SOF continues to play a vital role in strategic competition, uh, particularly in irregular warfare. So what is your view on the role of the Air Force Special Warfare and AFSOC in great power competition and future conflicts? Yeah, thank you for that, Senator. I, I think they're doing a tremendous job in really adapting. That's one of the things Special Operations has always done. They've really adapted to the missions that have been laid out in front of them. But in their transition, really, also to great power competition, they have adjusted some of their AFSCs to be more relevant. And so the uh, what was the uh, Special Operations Weather Team, now they're more mm -hmm. special reconnaissance. And they are, mm -hmm. they are part of this newly formed uh, Special Tactics Team, which includes the the uh, combat control teams, the pararescue, the uh, tactical air control party, and now these strategic reconnaissance, they're really forming uh, sort of the way that they did when, when they used to be in the old uh, great power competition, understanding how to operate ahead of main force elements in, in this case, in a more uh, electromagnetic spectrum mm -hmm. uh, contested environment. They are really doing some pathfinding work in helping to find those, take their niche capabilities and do things at speed and agility that maybe the, the standard uh, conventional forces couldn't do. I think I'm really impressed with how they're moving along. Yeah, thank you, uh, General. And I was excited to learn from you about the Air Force Special Reconnaissance, um, airmen and airwomen, and, and we appreciate their service. It's a great opportunity for them and for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Ernst. Senator Kelly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Kendall, General Alvin, General Saltzman. Thank you for being here today. Secretary Kendall and General Alvin, I want to thank you for your continued collaboration uh, as we secure a long-term future for davis monthan Air Force Base in Tucson. During last year's hearing, I asked you about the 
stand up of the new power projection wing at DM. And I'd like to follow up on that today and also follow up on uh, uh, Senator Ernst's um, discussion with you, General Alvin. In the last year, we've brought new search and rescue and advanced electronic platforms to DM, and I'd like to hear any updates on the power projection wing that you can provide. So, General Alvin, uh, starting with you. You've just embarked on this ambitious plan to reoptimize the Air Force for great power competition. A key component of this is the creation of deployable combat wings. The power projection wings provides just such a force for Air Force uh, Special Ops Command. Can you talk about the wings' overall import importance in the Air Force's strategy? Yeah, thank you for that, Senator. In, in some ways, some of the things that the special operations community have been doing have been a bit of pathfinders with our deployable combat wings, reorienting to where you have the ability to train with support teams in garrison in the way you expect to deploy with that unit together, training together, doing uh, individual training, then consolidated training, certification training. All those things are, are paving the way. And this, with, with this power projection wing at uh, davis Monthan, it is oriented towards the Indo-Pacific. So not only in its structure is it designed to be able to address the pacing challenge, but in its orientation as well. And I think uh, there will be lessons that we learn in the, the structure and the makeup of those sort of wings that will apply to the larger Air Force. All right, thank you. And Secretary Kendall, your new strat strategy here is uh, ambitious, and I support your efforts, but there are a lot of moving parts here and still a lot to be done to get all the units in place at davis Uh Can you provide assurances that you will still be able to manage all of these movements and stick with the timeline to stand up the power projection wing? Uh, Senator Kelly, we're going to do everything we can to make that happen. Uh, right now we're on track. The Site Activation Task Force is I was out there in February, as I think you know, and the EIS is on track for completion uh, uh, in 25, through quarter 25. Those are kind of the governing uh, events. So I think we're moving forward on, on schedule, but we'll, we'll continue to monitor that and make sure that we do. So you're not anticipating any new delays? Not at this time. And, and do I have your continued commitment here to ensure full transparency on this process? Absolutely, Senator. We'll work closely with you on it. And if any issues come up, would you please bring them to my attention as soon as you possibly can. Yes, I will. Thank you. And on um, electronic warfare, Secretary Kendall, um, it's a, EW is a cornerstone of any modern conflict and is only going to increase in importance as we prepare for great power competition. The Air Force and DOD need to continue to focus on electronic warfare because achieving EW superiority is going to be the key to getting air superiority. Um, I'm encouraged by systems like uh, the new Compass Call airplane that's being deployed at davis uh, but also the new F-15 EW systems. But I'm also concerned that our training ranges aren't able to replicate the threat sufficiently. And if we want to succeed in the Indo-Pacific, we need to ensure that our military is prepared for operations that are um, realistic because of the training being realistic. Uh, the emitters available for training uh, and our ranges aren't quite realistic enough to fool a fifth generation aircraft. This is, so it's no way to train for pacing challenges. Um, in my view, the exercises and the training we do should be the hardest thing we do here. Uh, so what, then it's, when it's time to fight, uh, we're more than ready to go. And it's imperative that DOD expand its training ranges to provide more realistic training. Achieving that level of readiness is going to require coordination across the branches. That's why I've advocated for DOD to assess the capacity for testing and training of EW operations and identify areas where multiple ranges can be used to simulate the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. For example, at the Fort Huachuca Electronic Proving Ground with its restricted airspace, favorable terrain, access to frequencies and spectrum, and bands of spectrum, and the authorities required to conduct EW training, it offers great potential for advanced and dynamic electronic warfare testing, experimentation, and training. So Secretary Kendall, how important is it to find opportunities for realistic EW training, and how can the Air Force benefit from EW testing and training in, in an environment like Fort Huachuca? 
it's critical, Senator. I haven't looked at Fort Huachuca specifically. Uh, General Alvin may have some information on that, but for Nellis and for Jay Park in Alaska uh, and for the exercises, I think you're aware of that we really see, we see down in the Pacific. Uh, having the ability to emulate both the threat and the space and time constraints that are applicable against the Beijing challenge are really important to us. So if Huachuca offers some additional opportunities there, we'd be happy to pursue those. It's, uh, what it, yeah, I'm, what I'm it, not what it, familiar exactly with yeah. what we're doing there. What it, what it offers is it's got geography. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a bowl you can emit at orders of magnitude. I think a couple orders of magnitude. Uh, power compared to what you can emit on, on the Barry Goldwater range. So it offers, uh, you know, F-35s can detect the sensor at a much greater range, more realistic training. Thank you. Understood. Understood. We'll take a look at it. Uh, let me recognize now Senator Budd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Secretary Kendall, we've spoken at length regarding the Air Force budget. My concerns with the Air Force planned divestment of fighter aircraft including the F-15E Strike Eagles from Seymour Johnson, my state of North Carolina. So I'm deeply concerned about what a growing fighter capacity gap could mean for the fight in the Indo-Pacific. But also, as was made clear over this past weekend, our fighter aircraft are also playing major roles in other regions, including U.S. Central Command every single day. So I'd like to turn to you, General Alvin, for just a moment. Again, thank you for being here. Uh, the committee heard from the commander of Indo-PACOM this year, and just recently, in fact, that there is a role for Strike Eagles in scenarios in the Indo-Pacific. And the head of NORTHCOM also told this committee the F-15E is in many ways unmatched air to ground, and in many ways um, it's unmatched air to air. It also has a phenomenal radar that can pick out low and slow moving, and it's got a great radar cross section, uh, which is useful for drones and other threats like cruise missiles. It was the 335th Squadron at North Carolina Seymour Johnson Air Force Base that proved that out on Sunday when they helped shoot down dozens of drones fired at Israel from Iran. The Supreme Allied Commander of Europe told the House Armed Services Committee last week that Strike Eagles, and I quote, figure heavily in his plans at UCOM. He also said it would be very important not to have a gap between the retirement of one aircraft and the arrival of the next. Most recently, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs agreed with these assessments of the F-15E and asserted that it is indeed a very capable aircraft. General Alvin, do you agree uh, with these officers' assessments of the capability and importance of the Strike Eagles in scenarios across the combatant commands, yes or no, sir? I, I absolutely do agree with those assessments. I would offer that those assessments are part of, first of all, I, I want to echo uh, what you said about the, what happened over the weekend. Brilliant crews, uh, skill and courage. That skill and courage in those, those aircraft also had a connection with a command and control system, brilliant stuff done in the AOC, an air battle management system, and all of those systems are what made it successful. And so the platform is very capable, but it has to have the systems around it in order to be effective and combat effective. And so going into the future, we, we would imagine that that platform is going to have to fire weapons longer range. That range has to have target custody for that munition to be able to track the target all the way. It needs to be able to, be, to defend itself in that theater. It needs to be able to have basing from which it can move around. All those things are what is going to make it successful against the pacing challenge. So that capability in and of itself is, is very impressive. But when, when you're in a fiscally constrained environment, we try and manage how many of those and those with respect to other platforms, what is the mix of the entire system beyond just the, the weapon and the aircraft to make it effective against uh, in the highly contested environment against the PRC, but it's a highly capable aircraft. Thank you, General. And I'll just note that many of those, including those at Seymour Johnson, have been upgraded or soon to be upgraded or can be upgraded to be useful into the 2030s or 2040s. Uh, Secretary Kendall, turning to you, sir, uh, where is the fighter roadmap required by the NDAA? We've heard, Secretary, that it's sitting with you. Uh, it's in final review. Should be over here shortly, Senator. We look forward to receiving that report. Uh, when should we expect the congressionally required report on divestment of F-15 aircraft, and uh, will it be compliant with Section 131 of last year's NDAA? 
Right now, our plans are to take out additional F-15Ds in the out years, but of course, we will be complying with the current law, and our 25 budget is con is consistent with that. Hopefully, in compliance with 131 of last year's NDA. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope the committee takes note of the testimony it's received this year and seriously considers prohibiting divestment of the F-15 Strike Eagles, particularly 26 F-15 Strike Eagles next year. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Senator Bud. Uh, Senator Rosen, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman Reed, for holding this important hearing. I'd also like to thank Secretary Kendall, General Alvin, and General Saltzman uh, for testifying today and, of course, for your service to our country. So, Secretary Kendall, I really appreciate, I know we've had so many meetings, but I really appreciated our phone call uh, last week, and I just want to take a moment to emphasize the importance of the Nevada Air National Guard and their mission, which they do so well. Not only does the 152nd Airlift Wing in Reno provide rapid global mobility and are currently preparing for deployment, but they're also they also protect the homeland by fighting those horrific wildland fires in Nevada and throughout the West with legacy C-130Hs. This mission is extremely dangerous as they fly heavy, low, and slow over these fires and challenging mountainous terrain. Upgrading to the C-130Js would provide increased power and cargo capacity for fire retardant, which would result in increased flight safety and, of course, firefighting capability. So, Sec Mr. Secretary, now that the FY24 Defense Appropriations Act has provided funding to procure eight additional C-130Js, funding that I fought to secure, can I have your commitment to seriously consider Reno when making a basing decision due to their obvious operational need? Uh, yes, sir. I think we're proceeding with that uh, basing selection, and I believe Reno is one of the uh, one of the units being considered. Thank you. And can I have your commitment that the Air Force will strongly consider location and the mission served in particular regions of the country when making their basing de decisions to ensure that the Air National Guard is best equipped to respond to these emergencies? I think we have a list of basing considerations that um, will be consistent with what we've done in the past. Thank you. I want to move on now to um, housing and our dorm shortages because uh, Nellison Creek, we actually, uh, 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 Senator Kelly was talking a little bit about Nitter over there at Nellis, but in Nevada, home to Nellis and Creech Air Force bases, I've observed firsthand the unique challenges that each base faces, particularly when it comes to affordable housing and dorm availability for our airmen and our guardians. Given the widespread and distinct nature of these shortages across the department and the Air Force, a one-size-fits-all solution is really insufficient to address the issues. So, Secretary Kendall, what additional authorities, if any, could be granted to service secretaries to um, address the current housing and dormitory shortages, thereby improving really the welfare and readiness of our personnel across the force. Um, we are looking at some innovative ways to do that through public-private partnerships in various forms. The Navy has a project in San Diego, I think, which is an example of how to do that. I'm not aware of additional authorities we need at this time, but if there are any, then I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you with that. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'm going to stay on you and stay on Creech Air Force Base a little bit. Uh, we love Creech. And uh, um, with the Experimental Operations uh, Unit, considering Creech Air Force Base as the eventual deployment of the collaborative combat aircraft, I'm going to say CCA, that's a little bit easier, we must address the complexities of the new systems basing. Decisions about where to house these systems needs considerations beyond, again, conventional requirements, such as employment options, infrastructure adaptations, airspace control, and, of course, electromagnetic spectrum availability. So given the challenges posed by these new systems, could you elaborate on the variables that the Air Force might, that you might be considering in the CCA basing decision, and specifically what unique characteristics and complications uh, might we anticipate? I said that work's going on now to decide what, what the considerations will be. We're a little bit early in the process. Okay. Uh, Creech is, I think, uh, a, a very reasonable candidate, however. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to move on. We're going to keep uh, uh, on Creech in particular, but Nellis as well to General Alvin. Um, you know the sacrifices. Each one of you really know the sacrifices and challenges that airmen and their families uh, make during their permanent change of station. And one of the difficulties that is really challenging for us is uh, finding and accessing child care at each new location. And so you know child care remains one of the most needed services for our military members, but it's still in such 
short supply, it's too expensive and difficult. So currently, um, General, in your role as Chief of Staff of the Air Force, what can you do to um, help increase access to affordable child care that's flexible, particularly Creech, they go 24, well, all of them, they go 24-7, 365. We need some help out there. Well, thank you, Senator, and, and I couldn't agree with you more. A lot of times we put things into, into a bin that can, called quality of life. or this, it's, it's actually a readiness issue as yes. well. To make sure that our, our airmen can focus on the mission at hand, understanding that they, they know that their families and children are well cared for. Specifically, I think we, I, what I can do as Chief of Staff is continue to advocate for the programs that the Department of Air Force is really already undertaking with respect to uh, going above and beyond uh, staffing those child development centers that we actually have. We've increased the staffing through the incentivization of 100% uh, uh, of a reduction, 100, free for the first child, 25% off for the other children right. for those who are working on staff there. That has actually increased our staffing from 63% uh, to 81%. So that's helping staff the existing one. Mm -hmm. But to your point, Senator, um, specifically in some of these non-traditional areas where you have not a normal business hours, this requirement, the increase in uh, family child care centers, the, the ones that the, the, so the ones that can be done at home or those who are, that are actually certified to do such. We've increased funding and incentives for that up uh, about 21% from where it was in FY23. So we continue to do that. And in other areas for, for uh, facility restoration and modernization, we put a lot of money into that as well. And on the Milcon side overall, some, sometimes we just need more facilities. On Milcon side, we have had uh, 35 Milcon projects under consideration. Uh, already 11 of them are already in appropriation and, and, uh, and design or and in delivery, the other 24 in design. Well, thank you. I look forward to continuing to work with you on all of that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Senator Kramer, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for your service and for being here. Um, and I look forward to the next session as well, uh, the classified section. Um, no, no hearing with the Air Force would be complete without me sort of jumping on board with some of my other friends who've asked about ISR. Uh, Secretary Kendall, I'm gonna go in more at it from the reoptimization plans that were released in February. And my office has sent an RFI asking about how the new Air Force structure might affect the 319th uh, Reconnaissance Wing in Grand Forks specifically. I mean, this is a very high demand Air Force base with very few people and, and assets. Um, these, how do, I guess to, to put it, Pointedly, how do these low density, high demand units like like the Global Hawk Wing in Grand Forks, um, or other ISR units for that matter around the Air Force, fit into the plan for reoptimization? I just and I just add, you know, I mean, I read all 12 pages on the airplane this morning. There's not a mention of ISR. There's lots of mentions, you know, 16 China RPC uh, eight. Uh, uh, anyway, no ISR in 12 pages. So how does how does Grand Forks fit into reoptimization? Um, it, it doesn't directly. The, the, re the reoptimization of great car competition is largely about focusing our readiness units on readiness, creating units that are focused on the future and sustaining advantage over time, uh, developing our people, some of the things we're going to do in terms of uh, their skill sets and so on, their, their readiness for that kind of conflict, mm -hmm. and also some changes in the secretariat. So specific units are not directly addressed. As we form units of action, that are either deployable or fight in place or are supporting, there may be some changes on the margin as a result of that. That's work that is gonna take place over some time. Um, there is no direct correlation between what we're doing under re-optimizing and specific units. Okay, but, I but we, so- we, are, we, we do have plans, I mean- the, I understand, but, but maybe not specific units, but ISR at large is not not even mentioned as a priority, where it used to be always mentioned yeah, as a priority. Yeah, yeah. ISR is a very high priority under our, our um, um, operational imperatives and under cross-cutting operational enablers. It's a very big part of our modernization program, which is separate from the, sure. the optimization. Right. Um, as we talked about earlier, we're moving a lot of our ISR capacity into space because our airborne platforms, many of them are too vulnerable to attack. They're not survivable enough. I, I we want to keep a balance. Yeah. We want to keep some airborne platforms mm -hmm. and some space-based capabilities as well. We have we have requirements to have ISR for less contested environments, more benign environments, as well as highly contested environments. So we're trying to have a balanced mix of capabilities uh, and sustain that while we move forward. Some of our legacy capabilities, if you will, mm -hmm. 
are less valuable to us against the pacing challenge or just not effective against the pacing I, challenge. No, I, so I, get all, I understand all that. Modernization is important everywhere mm -hmm. in, in, every, in every mission, and space is obviously critical to it. Obviously, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I have a, a bias for space, uh, but I also have talked to enough people both in space and especially COCOMs especially recently, especially very recently, who are frightened to death about the gap between um, their ability to find a target, identify a target, hit a target um, today or over the course of the next few years and the day that space is not so vulnerable that, um, that it can stand alone. General Alvin, did you want to speak to that? And then I do have a question about... Uh, yeah, the other thing I add to what the Secretary said is specifically within reoptimization for great power competition, we are aligning our wings in order to be able to deploy how we expect to fight. So there will be three different types of wings. One will be deployable combat wings. One will be in-place combat wings. Think, think uh, uh, missile wings. Sure. But the other are combat generation wings. And these are very, very important. And this is where the 319th falls in. It, it needs to be able to generate the combat power that can fall into a wing, because you're not going to deploy the entire wing at once. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't be it. That would be uh, uh, for some of the other types of wings. So while ISR may not be mentioned specifically, neither is, neither is probably air mobility or neither is maybe air refueling, mm -hmm. those are the parts mm -hmm. that they're, they're called the combat generation wings, because they will feed into the larger deployable construct. But we wouldn't expect the entire 319th to, take, to be able to go and deploy the entire wing because it's such a HDLD asset, right? It needs to be able to be distributed all across. So that's why it's part of these combat generation wings, and I'm, I'm ready to talk at yeah, length, no, and I'm gonna go over my time. And, so. Yeah, and, and as am I. So real quickly then, I, speaking of modernization, I'll just cut to it. I mean, we picked up a, some rumors in the last couple of days that the commercial engine replacement program might be in some doubt. Um, of course, the that would be the re-engineering of things like the B-52, which has only been around about 60 years, and we expect it to be around another 30 or so. Um, just, to, just confirm for me that that's just a vicious lie that somebody's spreading. Then they'll be happy. No, the commercial, the re-engineering of the B-52 is proceeding, if that's what you're asking about. That's what I'm asking. Thank you. We are, it's proceeding. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kramer. Senator Cotton, please. Secretary Kendall, General Alvin, thank you for appearance today. I want to add my uh, congratulations to the brave men and women uh, of the force who were involved uh, in the defense of Israel over the weekend uh, to include two former Senator Cotton defense fellows, Bud and Rowdy. I'm, to I'm told I'm not supposed to say anything more than that, but I'm glad to see that their skills did not atrophy while they were decimalisters up here for me. Now, it's very important uh, that we not just have our own capabilities, but that we train our foreign partners and capabilities. We can't be everywhere all the time at once. So I, I want to respond to Senator Warren's questions, General Alden, uh, about retired flag officers supporting foreign militaries. Um, I have a slightly different perspective. I think it's a great thing when America's retired generals and admirals go overseas, take the skills and the knowledge they've learned, and help train foreign military partners to be more proficient, to be more respectful of the laws of war, to be more professional in their own services. So far from taking steps to restrain retired flag officers serving under contractual relationships with nations like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, or emerging nations in Eastern Europe who are recent NATO uh, members, I think we should encourage it. General Alvin, I don't know what you plan to do in retirement. Maybe you plan just to go fishing all the time. But if you want to do that, I think that'd be a great thing for you to do. And, and this committee carefully considered that matter last year in our markup. And those markups aren't public, so you don't know what happened, but this was a, a, a serious debate then. And Senator Warren called one of these measures a loophole. It's not a loophole, it's specifically how we wrote it. Because we think it's a good thing for our retired flag officers to be advising partner nations whose militaries may not yet be as skillful or as professional as ours, but whose militaries we should want to be as skillful and professional as ours. So General Alvin, can I get your commitment that we will continue to ensure retired flag officers can in fact work with partner and allied nations? Yes, Senator, I, I certainly don't want to wade into the how the legislative process work, but I think that the that those two positions are not necessarily mutually exclusive, which is why we have the uh, approval process. There are only certain nations against which it, you are disapproved, and those we understand which those are. But there's still that stopgap is requires the approval 
of the Secretary and Secretary of State in order to do that. So I believe that stopgap it helps to mitigate uh, your position is uh, from Senator Warren's position. Secretary Kendall, you look like you had something you wanted to add on this question. Yeah, I just want to say, I think we're talking about apples and oranges here. I think Senator Warren's concerned about, very understandably, pilots who are hired by China, for example, indirectly uh, through. When, no, not, let, let me just stop, let me stop you there, because we're not talking about apples and oranges. She raised two different topics. I do want to say I am concerned about the second topic she raised, which is the practice of not just American, but Western trained pilots, mechanics, maintainers, and others going to work often indirectly through private military contractors for, say, China and South Africa, let's say. And that is something we definitely need to crack down on and something that, that we took steps with. Senator Kelly and I have worked on this challenge as well. We need to make sure that all those, those pilots and those maintainers and mechanics that we have trained are not using their skills that the taxpayers paid for to indirectly or directly help our adversary. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're counseling all those people as they leave the service to be aware of their obligations. I mean, I, I frankly think it should be strictly prohibited if not made a crime to work for a foreign military like China's. That contrasts to her first point, which is, again, military officers, usually flag officers, sometimes field grades, going to work for friendly nations like Saudi Arabia or Jordan or the United Arab Emirates, some fruits of which we saw over the weekend. So I just wanna say it's good when they go to work for pro-American countries, it's bad when they go to work for anti-American countries. It's pretty simple. I, I don't see what the complication is here. Yeah, I, we don't have any disagreement with that, Senator Khan. Thank you. Um, one final point, since we're talking about making sure that foreign partners have strong capabilities, so we don't have to carry the load everywhere. Secretary Kendall, General Alden, you know that a top priority for Senator Bozeman and for me is the for, uh, foreign military, mer military sales training mission at uh, Ebbing Air National Guard Base in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Um, we know that they're still working out a few things in terms of the construction and the airspace. Secretary Kendall, you, you've committed me in the past on several occasions that you're gonna make sure that this stays on time and that we have the Sound of Freedom return to the River Valley later this fall. Can I get your commitment again, given whatever the latest developments are on your end, that that is still going to happen on time this fall? Uh, before I give you a commitment about on time, let me go double check and see exactly where we are. I, I know we're moving forward on this, and I, I haven't had any reports that were that, that were just flipping schedule. But let I, me ha check I haven't it either. But you never know bit. when you're dealing with the real world of, of building this thing or moving that thing. I, I just don't want to have not dealing with the real world, but the bureaucratic world of red tape. So I just want to make sure that you've got a sword over the Gordian knot. You're ready to cut if you have to. We will do whatever we can to stay on schedule. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Senator Mullen, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, General Sutzman, Secretary Kendall, and General Alvin for being here. Um, and uh, for everybody that's your support staff that we know do, does the heavy lifting behind you, thank you for sitting through this hearing. I uh, obviously showed up late, so I'm back and clean up here. Secretary Kendall, I, I just want to tell you thank you for your attention uh, to the cadet that you and I visited about. Uh, it seems like it's working out. I, I I know that seems like a small thing for what you deal with, but it's important, uh, and I appreciate you taking the time to visit with me about it. Uh, it's good to hear, Senator. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad it's working out. Thank uh, you. I hope, hope one day you get a meeting. You'll understand why uh, why I want to do everything I can. A great, great young man. And uh, like I said, you guys, your attention really pushed things he's, forward. He's been through quite an ordeal, and he's doing really well. It's yes, encouraging sir. to see. It's yes, an amazing sir. story. Yes, it really it is. Um, I, uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary Kendall, I want to stay with you for just a second. Um, Lisa, I, I know you, you're up against a budget, and ideally, uh, everybody at the table right now, you guys would like to have as many airframes as you possibly can in the air uh, because of budget overruns uh, from with the E7s. You know, we're, we're divesting to invest. I think that's the term you guys are using. Uh, is that correct, General Alvin? I would say to modernize. <laughs> yeah, divest, invest, modernize. But we're going from, I mean, just what's on your all's docket right now you're going from 250 airframes to 91 airframes we know during time of war attrition plays a huge role um we've got our new planes that are coming out this you know doubled the cost at 2.5 billion dollars per plane that's going to be in the air um and we're talking about the maintenance of the e3s which is why we're bringing them out of the sky uh if i understand correctly the chairman and i we were at um uh Tinker Air Force Base this last Saturday and Friday both, and they brought up the concerns about being able to continue their mission. They say, you know, we'll do what was handled to us, but just to keep 
their mission capabilities right now, it takes 16, 16 uh, planes in the sky. That's to carry the current mission. There's going to be a lack between the delivery of the E3s and the E7s. Uh, we're not even talking about our fighting jets right now, but just in that frame alone, what do we, is it just about the money while we're divesting ourselves with so many airframes and going to so few? And it seems like we are in a pretty interesting times right now. And I, I'm really concerned, and I'm not trying to just get on to you and tell you how to do your girls' jobs. I'm saying, what do we, what do you need from us? How do, just mathematically looking at this doesn't make any sense. So, uh, Senator, I think uh, specifically with the E3, they're starting to divest themselves. This is one of those where just, just in order to keep them flying, is a challenge and we also the the capabilities that we're anticipating going to need in the future that this is the constant that we have sure trying to understand uh, how we maintain the readiness for today and still not leave my successors or my successor successor in in this seat saying why don't you have an air force that can compete with you know where china is right now and so we're trying to skate to where the puck's going to be with china at the same time preserve the readiness and so this is some of the challenge that we have and and uh so that managing this readiness is 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 never is never easy but i will tell you that um at some point the the statement of you know quantity has a quality on its own it, it, it's only good if that quantity can survive it's only good if that quantity can be effective now we saw over the weekend it can be effective against one type of adversary in one type of environment mm -hmm. in one area. But in order to meet what our national defense strategy wants us to do in the highly contested environment against a peer adversary, um, some of those capabilities, it, it really is just, you have more quantities that might be left in the bottom yep. of the Pacific Ocean. We need to ensure that those crews can survive, they can execute sure. their mission. And so that's where this tension between retaining enough for today and preserving enough for the pacing threat. And I, I totally understand that. Uh, and when we start talking about you know what's going down with the E3s. They they, they refer to us as the motors, um, which I know frames airframes can be upgraded with new motors put on the side of them constantly. Uh, is it even a possibility? You don't have to answer that. I'm just trying to think outside the box. But still, yet when we start talking about just sheer numbers, we start looking at what our adversaries are doing. They're coming out with planes with a lot less technology on them, uh, but just sheer numbers can overwhelm what we have. And when we're dropping this many airframes, we are not going to have the numbers. And I don't care. It's like a drone swarm. I don't care what you have in defense. Eventually, they're going to start poking through because ours do end in the bottom of the Pacific. And we cannot replace a $2.5 billion plane fast enough. Senator, the problem we have is that these aircraft, E3 is a really good example. Um, I was on one at Nellis a couple of years ago. It, it was built in 1972. Sure. Uh, the radar on it is an obsolete radar, basically, and our crews are working very, very hard to try to keep these airplanes operational, uh, and it's a really an uphill fight. So by retiring some of the E3s, we're able to free up some parts, at least keep some of the remaining aircraft more operational. Um, but, but they're not effective against the pacing threat, and they're going to die very quickly. They just don't have the resilience or the capability to survive. So we've really got to get to the next generation. So keeping airplanes around that are going to be ineffective and essentially um, very vulnerable to attack in the early stages of a conflict this is not putting us in a better position. But, and Chairman, I'll, I'll wrap up right here. Excuse me. But the gap between the delivery of the new plane and the old plane is what has me concerned. We're, we're divesting faster than we're getting them in, and the cost runs continue to go mind-blowing over cost. I mean, double. At some point, the math actually doesn't add up either, but how are we going to keep the mission capability there the, all the way through the transition? I mean, we haven't even got to the air guard that we're going to be losing and not be able to control the, our, our homeland by divesting of them too, but I, there's a real concern there, and I know that's a lot more to unpack than we have time here, but I, I, I don't want to be part of the problem, and I don't want to try telling you how to do your job. I want to work with you to make sure that we can stay mission capable. So I look forward to working with everybody here. Thank you again for your time. Really thank, appreciate the work you do. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Mullen. Senator Sullivan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to compliment you. Uh, you you've been one of the voices that's... Uh, Put it pretty bluntly about the challenges with China and we need to be ready actually for a war with China if they choose to do so. Um, so I appreciate your, uh, your directness on that. Let me ask, so um, 
You know, this is a tough question for all of you. General, it's a tough question for you. The president uh, talks a big game on the challenges, and then four years in a row, he puts forward a uh, inflation-adjusted cuts to the Department of Defense. Four years in a row. That's the Biden legacy. Now, he always expects us to boost it up. The left wing of his party doesn't like defense spending, so they, you know, double-digit increases in every other federal agency. I think this year is seven and a half trillion. But once again, uh, the Biden administration, the commander in chief says, nope, you guys get a cut. Shrinking the Army, shrinking the Navy, shrinking the Marine Corps. This budget right now does that. I don't think it shrinks the Air Force. But do you think inflation-adjusted cuts to the Department of Defense is what Xi Jinping and Putin um, should be seeing? I mean, is that how you prepare for war or enhance deterrence by cutting you guys? Uh, Senator, we've been very pleased to have significant increases in the Air Force budget, Department of the Air Force budget, uh, in 23 and 24 in particular. The, the, uh, the two-year budget deal that we have you know, does limit us under the Physical Responsibility Act in 25. And that's but I mean, in general, I'm in, in, look, these are hard questions for you guys, I know, because I know our military leaders. You go in there, you fight for a bigger budget. OMB, the president, they tell you, sorry, I'm going to increase Department of Interior by 25%. You guys get a cut. But in terms of our adversaries, China's building out a huge military they keep saying 7% increases. We all know that's not true. I was in a classified hearing. I'm going to just mention it because the uh, ND, uh, uh, DNI and the uh, DIA head, the lieutenant general, won't get back to me. They actually said in that hearing, it was a classified hearing, I'm just going to publicly say it, that it was about $700 billion that China puts towards its military uh, all in. It's a pretty big number. I think the American people should know that, which is why I'm saying it right now. But what do you think in terms of our adversaries, um, when they see defense cuts, what do you think that does for deterrence? Yeah, we're continuing to move forward, Senator, with our modernization program. Not quite at the rate that we'd like to have this year because of the Physical Respons uh, Responsibility Act, but we are moving forward. Uh, we are trying to manage the risk across time with the current force, uh, the more immediate force, and the future force. But I think we are at acceptable risk with the budget that we, we're presenting to the Congress. Let me uh, turn to one of my favorite topics. Billy Mitchell, the father of the U.S. Air Force, called Alaska the most strategic place in the world. I appreciate the Air Force's focus on that, um, on our state and how important it is. There's been a significant buildup in, in Alaska. We have over 100 fifth gen fighters located in Alaska now. Um, the Air Force's FY25 budget requests $250 million for the Joint Integrated Test and Training Center at J Bear. This represents a significant new training capability in how it will enable the Air Force to plug into live fire exercises at J Park probably the most advanced training range in the world, um, to give pilots across the U.S. military an unrivaled training venue. Can you uh, just talk a little bit about why that JITTC is so important? And but that's to you, General, as well. Yeah, Senator, I'll, I'll start by saying it's uh, like, like many of, of our uh, sort of fifth generation capable test and training centers, it, it's providing the opportunity to, to test advancements in a synthetic environment in ways you couldn't actually do it in the physical environment. But with this increase, uh, we are able to look at the models for how we believe that the, that the threat is going to act. We take these models, we can validate them in the JPARC, which is like the integration of these two between the live environment and the synthetic environment. It allows you to, to test some hypotheses in, in maybe a place where you wouldn't want to, the adversary to see you in open air. So that's a top priority in our... Um, Preparation for China conflict. Absolutely, and, and you, when you can replicate those through the JPARC modernization that we're doing with those emitters, then you can have a better chance of, of looking at those models, validating those, and maybe tweaking them back in. And between the two, the synthetic and the live, you get better than either of them individually when you can connect them. Let me ask one final question. My time's out, but Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, uh, we've been back and forth, this committee, me, the Air Force on tankers. 
and the strategic importance of having them located not just in one place in the lower 48. I was a little bit disappointed that after many years go back and forth with Air Force leadership, the, the final decision was, well, we're going to put all our tankers in the lower 48 at certain bases. I can't remember which ones, but it seems to be more of a budget-driven idea than a strategic-driven idea. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you and I and the previous uh, uh, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, who's now the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, got to a resolution on that where we say, well, we're going to be bringing more KC-135 tankers to Ileson. How are we doing on that? And I want to make sure in this hearing you're still committed to that. It seems like that timeline has kind of moved to the right. And um, it's really important, not just for Alaska, but for uh, the strategic ability to move aircraft anywhere in the world, but particularly to the Indo-PACOM theater if there's a conflict. Uh, Senator, you know, the capability is important to us, but as you're aware and we discussed, we have an issue with housing at Ileson that we're trying to address, and we, we, we're concerned about the quality of life of our people that we have to assign there, so that's an issue that we're working as we as we try to move forward on the tankers, I think. Well, you're still committed to move those tankers there, as you and I. We have to address the, the situation for our people as part of that process. Are you walking this commitment back to me, Ms. Secretary? Um, I don't think so, Senator. <laughs> Okay, you've committed to this to me like several times, so this is a little dis yeah. concerning. We're going to work on the housing issue, but can I just get a commitment again? I got it from the, heck, he's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs now, to be for KC-135s at Ileson. And we haven't changed our plans as far as I know. Do you have anything to add to that? And I'm, I think we're still in the same place, but we do need, we do, need to address this issue. General. Thank you, Senator Dillon. Yeah. That is still on our plan, Senator, but as we were just at Allison as well, we know we do need to ensure that we don't have the air crew and the support going up there as, as though it's an austere location because we know uh, the, the quality of life, we need to be able to retain those families up there as well. So the, the plan is, as it's written, hasn't changed, but the determination of how and when we can get housing and quality of life is going to be dispositive on, on how fast the pacing can, can go up that. Okay. Thank you. Thank so you. On. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, at this point, we will uh, recess the open uh, portion of the hearing and reconvene in SVC 217. Uh, let's try to be there about between 11.05 and 11.10, which will allow for uh, a moment to re recollect and, re and refresh. Uh, with that, I will adjourn the open portion. <laughs>